أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا We give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We testify that he is one in his majesty We ask him to send his salah and salutation on the noble soul of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also his companions and those that follow this path of um, righteousness until the day of accountability. Alhamdulillah, welcome again to another edition of our um, for a fortnightly usura. And as we've advertised, today we'll be talking about an important aspect of our life, both in this world and the year after. Because what's the point of doing good deeds? How could we know these good deeds? By the end of the day, when we get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then rejects it from us that you've not done anything really. So what are those things that we could do or that we could believe that could cause this to happen? Those are the things, inshallah, we're going to be learning today. So I would implore every single one of us to get our notepads and pen and be ready, inshallah. Our speaker is Ustaz Arif Ola. I don't think he needs any further introduction. Um, and if we start this way, inshallah, I think we'll go straight to the to the talk. We'll talk for about 50 minutes to an hour. Then we'll allow um, questions and answers afterwards, inshallah. Bismillah, Ustaz. Hayakumullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidim wa salim, nabiyyina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us tawfiq and success. He makes us of the people of iman and taqwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us firm upon the Surah Al-Mustaqeem until we meet him. Ustaz, if you're talking, we can hear you. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you can't hear me? One second. Can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? Well, it's just on your side, Akhi. Everybody else can hear. Maybe it's your... Uh, why can't I hear then? Everyone seems to hear you start, but I can't. Maybe your 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 volume your volume is on mute probably. Okay. Let's just carry on then, inshallah, while he works that out. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us tawfiq and success and he keeps us firm upon La ilaha illallah until we meet him. Um this is a very important topic, as you have heard from the introduction, and uh, I would like to extend my thanks and gratitude uh, to the brothers who have organized uh, this monthly usra. And wallahi, my brothers and sisters, one of the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you is that you have consistency. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from the people iman, consistency. And this is connected to the topic, as you can see. But the reason why I'm mentioning this specifically right now is because the brothers have constantly I mean, for as long as I've known them, they've constantly had regular durus, and this is a sign of khair. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "May you read Allah khair, you fatih fi din." Whoever Allah subhanahu wa taala wants good for, He gives them understanding of the knowledge. Now, you've got that statement, then we've got another statement on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Ahabu amali ila Allah." The most beloved actions to Allah are what. Those that are consistent, even if it's just a little bit, even if it's every two weeks, an hour every two weeks, it's not enough. Don't get me wrong, it's not enough. But the consistency is the point that I'm saying. And this is a sign of khayr. And this is good news for us all. So I'd like to thank the brothers again, and I'd like to thank all of those people who have attended, and people who are yet to attend, and people who are listening on a regular basis who have not been able to attend because the weather is nice. I do understand. So I'll try and keep this as short as possible so you guys can enjoy the sun as if you're here in the uk the topic the nullifiers of good deeds now this is very important and i'll tell you why this is an essential part of a lot of aqidah books as the uh, brother just said uh, before dr abdul majid this is really important because what we are concerned about is how to do good deeds what qualifies as being a good deed and then how to maintain the good deed Therefore, you will find many ulama from the books of, uh, you know, from the books of Ahlul Sunnah when they're talking about aqidah, when they're talking about iman, when they're talking about tawheed, 
they will always mention something which would nullify the, uh, the Iman and the Aqeedah and the Tawheed. And this is based on the statement that every single one of us need to believe in and must believe in and do believe in, which is La ilaha illallah. That statement alone has a negation of nullifiers. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, nobody, nobody can become a Muslim if he says, Rabbi Allah, Ilahi Allah, Allah, Allahu Ilahi. Does that person become a Muslim if he says, my Lord is God, my, my Lord is Allah, my Lord is Allah? Never. Why? It's because that person has not negated the nullifier for himself. You have to negate the nullifier to affirm the affirmation, and there you've got the completion of your iman and aqeed and your tawheed. La ilaha nullifier, everything gone, everything. No Buddha, no idols, no human, no nothing. Illallah affirmation. Therefore, what I'm saying here is that this is a really important topic. And it's, it's intrinsic to every single Aqeedah book. You will find it being mentioned by the ulama. However, one thing that I haven't found, and correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody is able to do so, and I would really like to hear if anybody has got a correction for me on this. But from the time of the Salaf, a standalone book which talks about the nullifier of good deeds, I don't know of any. There are contemporaries which have written about Mubtidat uh, al-A'mal or Muhbibtat al-A'mal, those things which nullify good deeds. From the time of the Salaf, a standalone book which talks about the nullifiers of good deeds, I, I wasn't able to find it. The closest that I came to are chapters from Bukhari and Muslim and other books of Hadith from the uh, from the Ummahat, from the you know from the foundational books of a Hadith, which we will inshallah include in our uh, presentation here. But a book alone which talks about the nullifiers, I couldn't find it. Now, there's a reason for that. And this is connected to the introduction that I've just mentioned now, which is every time you turn you, from the ulama of the salaf, they talk about aqeedah, they talk about iman. They've always come by talking about the nullifiers, part of the discussion. So it doesn't require a separate book. Therefore, from the time of the Salaf, it would be very difficult for you to find something like this, to the best of my knowledge. But even in the, the books that we do know of, or the books of Aqeel, you will find affirmation negation, affirmation negation. Here we're talking about the nullifier of good deeds. And inshallah, in today's session, what we're going to talk about is what is a good deed? How do you recognize a good deed? And then we are going to talk about the nullifiers of good deeds, and that, inshallah, will take up uh, until hopefully half past three and, and complete the hour. So the first question for you guys, you, know, you guys may well know by now, the regular attendees, uh, I prefer for these sessions to be interactive, so I'm going to ask you a question. Question is, what is worship? All of us do it, inshallah, on a regular basis, but what is it? You can put your mics on and you can use the chat. What is worship? No one? Ah, good, Bilqis. Any act that connects you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nice, very good. Very good, Barakullah Fiki. Everything we do for the pleasure of Allah, showing devotion and gratitude to Allah, worship, worship is to submit to Allah alone. Submit with what though? Khalas, if a person says, I submit and that's it, to pray to Allah. Okay, so praying, but siyam is not worship. Hajj is not worship. Sadaqah is not worship. Being good and dutiful to your parents is not worship. The act of doing what is being instructed without question. So you've been told to do something and you don't question it, you submit. Well, then what about those things? which we have been told to stay away from, nullify. You see, we have to be very precise in what we're talking about here. Not only for ourselves, but for those people that will come after us, our children, our family, 
our non-Muslim friends, our Muslim friends, if we're going to have conversation about something which is so pivotal to what it means to be a Muslim, you need to have a comprehensive answer. So you can't just say the first thing that comes into your head. I'm not saying that you're doing that, but I'm just saying you, can't, you have to have an answer which is all-inclusive. So a person is saying here, showing devotion and gratitude to Allah, that is worship. Okay, what if a person prays and he is not showing devotion and gratitude? He's just praying. Is he not worshipped? Dr. Majid, a comprehensive term that includes all that Allah loves and moving from all that he prohibits, either in speech or action, open or secret. Uh, I think he's seen my notes before I put it. <laughs> this is the best definition that has been given to worship by many of the ulama. They have said this is the best definition. Linguistically, ibadah means for you to show submissiveness towards something. Ibadah, that's why the servant is called the abid, the ab, because he's got some kind of servitude towards his master. Linguistically, ibadah is to show uh, submissiveness and humility and submission towards something. This is an abd. So the Messenger of Allah in the Hadith Sahih, Ta'isa Abduddinaw perishes the servant of the gold coins. Ta'isa Abduddinaw perishes the servant of the silver coins. Ta'isa Abdul Khamisa. Uh, Parish is the servant of the person who wants to have luxurious clothes and luxur luxurious things. Why is he called a servant of these things? Because this becomes his objective on a daily basis. Wakes up in the morning, all he's thinking is about is gold, silver, and clothes. He is of servitude to those things. The Messenger of Allah said, Abdul Dinar, Abdul Dinar. Linguistically, Abd is where you show that kind of servitude and submissiveness towards that thing. Yeah. But here, what we're talking about is the technical term for it. And this is being given by Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, in his book, al ubudiyah And I've not put the page number because in Arabic, it's different to the English. Uh, and the Arabic one, I think it was on page, I can't remember what it was, but it's in the beginning. He talks about it in the very beginning, so you can refer back to that. But here we have it in Arabic, and I've left it in Arabic because I want to use this as an opportunity to go through some Arabic. now. Quite often, a lot of people ask, what is the best way to learn Arabic? So they will join an Arabic course, and they might do it for a year or two years, maybe less, maybe more. And then they come back and say, have you got any advice about learning Arabic? They've been doing it for a long time. Well, I know a person who's been doing it for about 10, 11 years. If you ask him about Nahu and Sarf, expert in it, but when you ask him to speak, he can't speak. Now, this is not to degrade him. May Allah bless him and increase him. But there is a problem here somewhere. If you've been doing something for 10, 11 years and you're not able to now be fluent in that thing, whether it's language or otherwise, then that basically tells you that there's a problem in the methodology. One of the best ways that I feel myself, and even speaking as a language teacher with my background in English language teaching, one of the best ways for you to learn a language and to become proficient in it is for you to engage with that language. This is not right, but a lot of the students that we used to teach in Saudi Arabia, they used to speak English better than us. They used to come up with words that I, you know, sometimes I never even used in my life. And when you ask them why is it, they say it's because we watch movies all day. Now, I'm not trying to say that this is right, what they're doing, but the, the theory is correct, which is, okay, now you're picking up some vocab, start listening to lectures in Arabic, even if it's Arabic English. Concentrate on the Qur'an, which is that you are reading. Concentrate on the Hadith. If you go to a, a Jum'ah, Qutbah, and they're talking in Arabic, then concentrate on it and try and learn and try and pick up. Because when you immerse yourself in it, you will pick it up. Then it will come on your tongue and it will go into your... Cognitive, it will go into the way that you think, and you will benefit a lot more rather than just trying to attend Arabic lessons. I'm not trying to say that Arabic lessons are not good, they are your staple and your bread and butter, but you need to increase in practice and vocab. Then this is one of the ways I'm going to show you how you can do that. So Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah he says, Al ibada here. Why does he say here and not huwa? Because al-ibada has a ta marbuta on it, which makes it feminine. So he doesn't say huwa, here. Al-ibada, 
Let me just type it so it becomes easier for us to understand what I mean. Al ibada. Because it ends with a ta like that, it makes it feminine. So al ibada. So worship. Here it is ismun. What's the ism? An ism is a noun, the name of something. So worship is a name, lima, lima, whatever. Yuhibbuhullahu wa yardahu. Right. This here is a ya. And this ya shows you that there is a verb that is taking place. Now, because it is a ya, and it doesn't come with a wow and a noon in the end, that basically tells you that the person that's doing it is masculine. It takes a masculine uh, pronoun. Not necessarily, obviously, in the case of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have male or female gender. But he uses the masculine pronoun for himself. So, yuhibbuhullah. If it was a woman, it would be tuhib. But here it is yuhib. If it is a group of people, yuhibbun. But because we've got, so now this teaches you that it's a verb, but because there is no wow and noon, so then we know, and there's a ha at the end, now we know that this is a masculine singular, yuhib. Now that's, that's the pronouns. Here is the verb. So we can change this verb and you can say yakun. We can say yalab, eat, drink, play. But this is the formation here. Yuhibbuhullah. So now, ibadah is a name for whatever. Yuhibbuhullah. What does hib mean? Love. Whatever Allah loves. So now here, it's the same thing. Ya and aha. What does that mean? Whatever is in between is a verb. And these are pronouns on each side to tell you that the person that's doing it is what? Masculine, plural or singular? Singular. Yeah? Everyone's going to be upset with me, Dr. Adanaji. This is supposed to be an Aqidah lesson. I've changed it to Arabic lesson. I didn't sign up for this. Right. Allah wa yarda. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with. Right. Min. What does min mean? What does min mean? Min. From. From. Min. Al-Aqwal. Aqwal is the plural of gold. So what does that mean? From okay. statements. From statements. wal -af'al. The singular is fi'l. So that makes af'al, sorry, fi'l is the singular. And fi'l is actions. So wal af'al, actions. wal amal amal again, actions is the same thing. But we would say that the difference between af'al and actions would be af'al or actions and a'mal or deeds. Okay. Al-zahira wal-baatina. Al-zahira, as Dr. was saying before in his, those which are open, baatina, those which are hidden and in secret. So now this is the definition. And as you can see here, we've ended the Arabic exercise, but I just want to show you here, this is the importance of doing it like this. When you do it like this and you pick out statements like this, phrases like this, and you break them down, you will increase in your vocabulary and you increase in the expressions that you can use. See, now the way that you learn language is not just by vocabulary, but it's by expressions as well. So every single one of us, we know. How do you say, how, how are you in Arabic? Um... Wait, how, alaykum. how do you say kef al kef al what do you say in response now when you break those words down you can benefit by okay um kef means how hal means uh you know state and i mean the kaf at the end makes it about you you could do it like that but look my son here kef al he doesn't really know the breakdown of it but he knows the expression i know the expression Therefore, this is a useful technique for us to improve in our Arabic. Either you look at the vocabulary by itself or the expressions by itself, pick up on that, continue with your Arabic lesson so you've got some kind of form and grammar that is going to help you in that. But wallahi, my brothers and sisters, if you do it like this, especially with the Book of Allah, you will see a lot of khair and barakah.
Right, so this is the definition of worship. Everything which is beloved to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, with actions, uh, sorry, with statements and actions and deeds which are open and hidden. Why are we talking about this? But what we're talking about on the nullify of good deeds. So let's understand what is a good deed before we talk about its nullify. So now what is a good deed? Anything which is beloved to Allah. Anything which is beloved to Allah. Salah is beloved to Allah. Okay, walking down the street, is that beloved to Allah? Yeah. It depends. Therefore, it's not an act of worship. But can it become an act of worship? How? If you do the right thing, please, I So give me an example. You're going to go to the park in a bit. So how can you make that into an act of worship? I'll go to the park for the sake of Allah. How can you go to the park for the sake of Allah, my brother? I know. You can go to the park for the sake of Allah to meet your brothers and make them happy and have a good time with them so that they don't do anything which is bad and you can advise them if you see something wrong and you want happiness to enter into their hearts. So you're going to play football with them and you're going to you know, go on the swings and the slides with them, etc. This is now how a simple action can become an act of worship. Therefore, we've got actions which are purely acts of worship, such as salah and siyam, hajj, zadaqa. This has to have the right intention where you're doing it for the sake of Allah and seeking Allah's akhirah. Then you've got those things which are not acts of worship, which is the opposite of this. Those things which Allah is not pleased with from statements and actions and deeds, whether they are hidden or not hidden. And then you've got those in between. These are the permissible actions, eating, drinking, sleeping, wearing clothes, uh, going down the street, uh, going to work, studying something. All of these things are permissible, but it can turn into something which is worship or it can turn into something which is Simple, based on what you can see here on the spectrum. Thank you. Right, next question. Are there conditions for worship to be accepted or will Allah accept worship from anyone? Are there conditions or not conditions? If there are any conditions, can you please state them? If there are no conditions, then just say so. There are no conditions. Allah accepts from everyone. Allah is merciful. It has to be done for Allah alone. Okay, so if a person prays a sixth rak'ah, or oh, sorry, a sixth salah, sorry, not rak'ah, sixth salah, so he prays Fajr, he prays Dhuhr, he prays Asr, he prays Maghrib, he prays Isha, and he invents a sixth one. What? But he's doing it for Allah alone. Is that worship? Is that accepted with Allah? In your face. You're making stuff up. So this definition here needs reviewing then. If this is an innovation, like, as you were saying. A person is going to do a qurbani next month. And he does a qurbani from using a chicken. Or a tomato. <gasps> Let's do a sacrifice for a tomato. Would that be accepted with a lie? I'm doing it sincerely for the sake of it. I'm going to chuck this tomato. And I'm going to give it to a poor person. Oh, yeah. No, I'm talking about the udhi, the qurban. Is that going to be accepted? No. If a person sacrifices a tomato. It has to be done as stipulated in the sharia, according to the Quran and sunnah, according to the sunnah as well, excellent. So there are two conditions. There are two conditions for your acts of worship to be accepted. And they are based on this ayah here that we just recited yesterday. Right, I'm going to start the ayah. I want you guys to finish it. All right, are you listening? I will be the shaitani regime. Pull. Innama ana basha. Go. Your turn. Your turn. Your turn. Pull. Innama. Go on. Oh, he's got food in his mouth. Right. What ayah is this? Um, what surah is this? Last line of Kaf. Last line of surah al Kaf. Wait, what? Pull. Innama. Go on quickly. Pull. Innama. Quickly. Pull. Not you, you didn't. Well, yeah, wait, wait. Can I hear you? Now, what we could do is we could go through the Arabic and to show you exactly what I was talking about earlier, but this is a very lengthy line, but I'm not going to do all of it, but I am going to do some of it. 
So the translation here, you can pick it up on your phone very quickly. So I'm not going to go through the whole translation. But here is the point. And here we have a tafsir from Ibn Kathir to confirm the point that we're making. For man, so who, can, wants or used to be. Yarju rabbi. So now, can it really is, is the to be state. So this could be past, it could be present. So whoever wants, wanted or wants to, yarju. remember here, now this is a ya. What does that mean? That basically means that this bit here is going to be a verb. So basically, فَمَنْ whoever wants to see لِقَاءَ is the meeting. رَبِّهِ Lord, his Lord, because the he at the end makes it his. His Lord. Kitabuhu, Babuhu, Sayyaratuhu, the Oha at the end makes it his. Possessive. Fal. So now, whenever you see a fa, normally this is a fa which has been added as prefix, which makes it, makes it so. Faman, fal, ya'mal. All of these are so. They're just the fa means so. Fal, ya'mal. Fal, ya'mal. So let him do good deeds. Sorry, fal yamal amalan saliha. So that's what it is basically. So deeds do good. That's how the subject or verb agreement is in Arabic. And I believe in French as well. So in French, you will say deeds good do, something like that. But in English, we will say do good deeds. So, like, so this is here, yeah, like that. Yes, well, it's backwards to us, but it's right for him. Fal yamal amalan saliha. Do good deeds. Right. So now, if you want to meet Allah, condition number two on our list, which is to do good deeds. What's a good deed? We just have the definition. What is a good deed? What, what is it? What is it? One small one. What is a good deed? Here's something for the sake of Allah, and you want to get reward, and it's a reward. You went in. You were upstairs. What's a good deed? What is worship? Um, to um, to do something for the sake of no way. What is worship? I, oh, I, I, on, I forgot. I was praying so hard. Should we start the lecture from the beginning again? Should we go back? Yeah. What is worship? People at home, what is worship? Help these two little children out. Worship, like, what is a worship? Okay, now you're just guessing. Yes, it's a lot is a worship, but what is what that's just an example. An action done to please Allah that is not sufficient. Oh, it's just, it's just that is not an action to done to please Allah is not sufficient. So if a person celebrates the Prophet's birthday, oh, I'm doing it to please Allah, is that sufficient? No. That pleasing Allah? What we need <laughs> as a definition of worship is everything which pleases Allah. Everything which pleases Allah from statement, actions, internal, external. So now in this ayah, for Yamal Amal and Salih, now you know what that means. If you want to meet Allah, do good deeds. What's good deed? Everything which is beloved to Allah, internal, external. Mm -hmm. From actions, from statements. Wala you shrik be go and finish the ayah. How do you do undo? How do you do undo? What's the shortcut for undo? What's the shortcut for undo? Yeah, no. What's the shortcut? Right. Then make sure, okay, no, let me just translate as this. And not yushrik. Why is it yushrik? What does that mean now? No, no, but why is there a yeah at the front? To make it sound consistent. So, no, no, no. So, because there is a verb there. So, now, wala yushrik. So, the person should not do shift. Be iba be whenever you see that as a prefix, it means um with with his worship, Rabbihi Ahada, no one in this life. Right. So now here we have two conditions for acts of worship to be acts of worship. I mean, Kathir Rahimullah says these two factors form the basis for an acceptable deed. So now we know what is worship. What is worship? Everything which is beloved to Allah, not an action that pleases Allah. There's a difference. You see, Ibn, Ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, look at this thing from Ibn Mubarak. He said, Ash-sha'n, laysa an tuhib, Ash-sha'n, an tuhab. What? Anybody can say that they love Allah. 
Even the kuffar say we love Allah. Ibn al-Mubarak is saying here, the important thing is not for you to say you love Allah. The important thing is for Allah to love you. For you to have acceptance with Allah. That's exactly what we're talking about in this topic, aren't we? A person could do lots of good deeds, he could be nullified. He think, well, I did all of this for Allah. But he wasn't beloved to Allah. So Allah negates it. So now this is a big difference between what we can see here in the chat. The person is saying here that worship is anything which is done to please Allah. That is not necessarily worship. Worship is it's the other way around. Worship is whatever is beloved to Allah. Now this is really important because whether people worship Allah or not worship Allah, worship remains worship. Does that make sense? Imagine there's going to be a time that nobody worships Allah. That's going to happen. May Allah protect us from that time. There's going to be a time that nobody worships Allah. Does that now mean? Does that now mean that people can do deeds to attain the pleasure of Allah, even though they claim that they're going to do so? It's not possible. You get the point that I'm making here. <laughs> worship will remain worship. These are things which are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's going to be a time, and there already exists amongst us people, who say that they are worshipping Allah, but they are not attaining the pleasure of Allah. Therefore, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is found in what he is pleased with and what he will accept. Not what we are trying to put forth. We have to do it on his terms. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. So now we know what worship is. Anything which is beloved to Allah. There are two conditions for this. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, says from this ayah, there are two factors which form the basis of an accepted deed, an accepted act of worship. Number one, it must be done sincerely for the sake of Allah. How do we say this in Arabic? When you do something sincerely for Allah. No. Ikhlas. Ikhlas. Something which is done sincerely for Allah is known as an ikhlas. And it must be done in accordance with the sharia of the Messenger of Allah. This is known as al mutabaah Now, now, if you just excuse me one second. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, so now, ikhlas and mutaba'ah are two conditions for the act of worship to be accepted. Now, we have other evidences from the Kitab and the Sunnah which confirm this. In Bukhari and Muslim, the Messenger of Allah said on authority of Umar bin Qutab, hadith, which we've all heard before, probably some of us have memorized, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ Surely your deeds, your acts of worship, are based on your intention, meaning... Why did you do it? You did it for Allah. If you did it for Allah, then it would be accepted. If it wasn't, then you will not have it accepted. Why? Because everyone will be rewarded for what he intended for that action. So that's the first condition. So now we can see when Kathir is half right already. Now to confirm that he is totally right, we have another hadith, and this is now known as mutaba'a, which is that your action must be in conformance with what the Messenger of Allah so taught us. This is from the hadith of Aisha in Sahih Muslim, and you can see the reference there as well. Man amila amanan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa raddun. Anyone who does an action which is not in conformance with what we did, the way we did it, meaning the Messenger of Allah, then it will be rejected. Now we have come to a very important point, my brothers and sisters, which is we have defined what is a good deed. If the person hasn't done it with these two conditions, he's not included in the title in the first place. And we've been talking about this now for, I don't know, more than half an hour. And I'm pretty sure the people here have learned something new. I'm pretty sure the people at home have learned something new. And even if you haven't learned anything new, knew this all before, at least now it has been revision and you have, um, you know, revised the evidences and we've, you know, refined it. Because this thing here, what is a good deed, has to be for us determined first in order for us to then understand what his nullifiers are. It could be that a person is doing what he thinks is good deeds, but it's not even a good deed, let alone having it nullified. Now you can understand, my brothers and sisters, that the importance of this topic 
cannot be underestimated. Every single one of us work really hard on a daily basis mm -hmm. to do these two things. Okay. It might not necessarily be at the forefront of your head that, okay, when I'm praying Salatul Fajr, I'm quite ikhlas, I'm doing mutabah. But it's become part of your life. It's been part of your education. And inshallah, you don't need to keep renewing. Is it a class? Is it mutaba? Is it a class? Is it mutaba? You wake up in the morning. Why do you wake up in the morning? What gets you out of bed? Fajr. It's three o'clock in the morning. It's four o'clock in the morning, depending on what time you get up for Fajr. And you know the alarm's gone off and you just want to go back to sleep. What gets you up from your bed? A class. You've got an option of either sleeping more or getting up. Shaitan makes you... Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. A pop-up comes on your screen. You switch it off. Why? Why do you do that? What's the purpose? Why are you looking? Because you are being sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I know I just said you don't need to constantly think about it. I mean, you do really. Because some of the salaf, Sufyan al-Thawri, Allah said for 20 years, I kept working on my ikhlas. Kept working on my ikhlas. Because it is really important. But the reason why I'm saying what I've just said is to yeah. highlight that the fact that we are already doing these things. When you pray, do you make up the way you pray? No, you don't. No. You've based it on what you've been taught and you feel that this is the way that I'm praying, which is close to the way that the Messenger of Allah did it. Therefore, every single one of us works really hard on a daily basis and inshallah we have these two already. If you don't have these two, then it is worry. Why do you wake up in the morning? Because my mom told me to. Why do you wake up in the morning? Because my dad told me to. Why do you go to the masjid? Because my dad forces me to go. Why are you learning the Quran? Because I've got no option. I'm not allowed to stay out. That is not a class. That is not a class. Why do you pray in the way that you pray? I don't know. I just, I just pray like this. Been told, pray like this. So you don't know why you pray like this. Are you sure that the Prophet ﷺ prayed like this? Well, no, I'm not sure. Then that is a problem. There are certain things that we all must learn and confirm for ourselves whether we're following the Messenger of Allah ﷺ or not. Otherwise, it's not a good deed in the first place, as you can see here, let alone having it nullified. It's not gone on your scale of good deeds, unless if you've got these two. But having good thoughts for us and the Muslims, Every single one of us, inshallah, are working towards having these two things or have accomplished these two things, inshallah, for a lot of our deeds. So now, are you going to spoil them? Can you see how important just having these two things to make sure that you've done a good deed is so difficult and it requires a lot of diligence and obedience and submission because in its nature, it's ibadah. And we have seen, we've seen what ibadah is, it's to show Submission and servitude and humility and, and lowering yourself and conforming and obedience. It's not easy. But then you have to come with these two conditions as well. Right. What nullifies deeds then? So now we have talked about what is a good deed. Anything which is beloved to Allah. This requires two conditions. It must be done with sincerity and with the following the message of Allah Wasallam. If we have not got this far, then you go back and review your situation and start from scratch. Because you're not doing good deeds. If you are and you're checking that list, and you know, I am doing it for the sake of Allah, and I have learnt this thing that I'm doing from a book, and this book or this shaykh that taught me it is from, you know, telling me the delil, and I know that I'm understanding it in the correct manner. Khalas, this is good now. Alhamdulillah, you've accomplished something which is really important. It's extremely heavy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why else would you think that he would multiply each good deed by 10 minimum? Because of the importance of the thing that you are doing and the amount of effort that you have put into it. Allah is merciful. But now you've done all of that and you've attained good deeds. What are the things that nullify good deeds? What do you think, Farhul? Yes. Uh, if you don't do it with sincerity to Allah. Yeah, but that's what I'm trying to say to you. If you've not done it sincerely to Allah, then it's not a good deed in the first place. So you can just X that out. But let's say you've done the deed sincerely for the sake of Allah. And you have done it with accordance to the Messenger of Allah Mutaba'a. You've got this now real important diamond in front of you. Really important gem of a good deed. What is it that can nullify this good deed? Bad deeds. Bad deeds. What kind of bad deeds? Bad deeds is too big. Oh. 
showing off. Showing off. Okay, now this is important. Great. This is really good. I'm glad that you said showing off. Would showing off nullify the do good deed or would showing off not make the deed accepted in the first place? Very good that you brought this up. Not accepted in the first place. Thank you very much. Why not? Because it doesn't have what? The two conditions. Excellent. Therefore, if it doesn't have the two conditions, by very definition, it is not something which is beloved to Allah from the statements and the actions which are apparent and which are hidden. Do you understand that? See, so now this is important. So now imagine a person who's got ikhlas and a person who's got mutaba. What is it that could nullify those good deeds that he has? Imagine now you've got your scales in front of you, your muqiyam. Imagine you're standing in front of Allah and you did everything on the scale of good deeds with sincerity and the following of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What could it be that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, well, you did all of these, but they're going to be taken away. What's going to make you bankrupt? That's the essence of the question that we're asking. And that is the topic of the lecture. So number one on the list, usurping other people's rights. Yes, maybe. But there is something which is more important than that. We're talking about the rights of the creation. So now another example, backbiting, another right of the creation. Why are we thinking about the creation for? What is the biggest thing that can nullify out everything in just one go? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, the best of mankind, the most sincerest and the most truest, the master and the leader of not just the prophets, but every single man and jinn. وَلَقَدْ أُوْهِيَ إِلَيْكَ It has been revealed to you and for those who came before you لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ If you did shirk, O Muhammad, even though it's impossible. But if you did shirk, O Muhammad, لَيْحْفَطَنَّ عَمَدٍ وَلَتَنْكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ You did shirk all of your good deeds. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم How many good deeds have you done? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. It's not even numerable for you to count how many good deeds he has done. I'll tell you why. Because every single good deed that we do right now, he gets a reward for it as well. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may our mothers and fathers be ransomed for him in sacrifice. This is because if a person teaches someone else something which is good, he joins upon them something which is good, he gets a share of the reward. So now imagine the status of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. Just try and imagine that. You won't be able to, but just think about the amount of good deeds for 23 years that he did himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Constantly subject to assassination, he was harmed. His family cut ties with him. He was boycotted. He was starved for three years. Not just from the creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from him. His uncle took from him. His wife took from him. His children took from him the luxuries of the dunya. Those are just the tests. Then look at the acts of worship. The Messenger of Allah, so Sallam, Hudayf ibn Yaman, he says, this is an optional prayer, yeah? not an obligatory one. He says, I stood with the Messenger of Allah, so Sallam, and he got to, he started reciting Baqarah. He got to ayah number 100, roughly, and I thought, now he's going to make ruku. And he carried on. Until he got to the end. So I think, okay, now he's going to go to the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. Now he's going to go into Ruku, surely. He starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu qayyum. Al Imran. So Hudayfa is thinking, okay, okay, maybe he's going to get to about 100 on Al Imran. Until he gets to the end. 
And he thinks now, surely he's going to go into Ruku. Hudayfa even says, uh, the narrator of this narration, he said, I was having bad thoughts in myself. Should I break off from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? When is he going to finish the Salah? The Messenger of Allah. This is just a Nafil Salah. Then he begins with An-Nisa. And then his Ruku was similar in men. Then his Suju was a similar. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is just an optional. Aisha radiallahu anha, one day she's looking at him, she's saying, Ya Rasulullah, this act of worship that you're doing about his Ramadan, she said, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed four raka'at. La tas'alu an tulihin wa husnihin. Do not ask how beautiful they were and how lengthy they were. In another narration, she says to the Messenger of Allah, she actually asks him, O Messenger of Allah, the way that you pray is so beautiful and so lengthy. Why do you do this to yourself when Allah has forgiven you for all of your sins? So now the Messenger of Allah has so many good deeds. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to him? If you did shirk, how many times do you have to do shirk? More than once? Constantly a life of shirk? No, no, no. One act of shirk then it is over. Completely, everything is completely nullified. We've got a list, and we're going to go through the list. But here, I just want to point out a very important principle, which is that the ulama have, when they have talked about that which nullifies a good deed, now this is connected to the topic. When the ulama have talked about nullifiers of good deeds, there are two types of what the ulama referred to as a nullifier. So here, the way I've worded it, there is a difference between a deed being nullified and a deed being nullified of reward, but the action is accepted. Does that make sense? The action has been accepted, but your reward zero. That's one scenario. That's the second one in this sentence. The first one is that the the, the, re, the action was accepted, but then it was nullified afterwards because of something that you did. If a person didn't have the two conditions, it wasn't accepted in the first place. So there's three scenarios now. Hopefully you're with me on this, yeah? If the person doesn't have good deeds and the conditions of good deeds, then it's not accepted in the first place. If a person has completed it, he's worked really hard and gone through all of the processes, ikhlas and mutaba, but then he does a deed, he could nullify that deed. It does a bad deed, it nullifies that good deed, even after all that hard work and toil. But it could be that a person goes through all that hard work and toil, the deed is accepted, but the reward is not. So for example, a person prays and he completes the salah with all of its conditions, all of its pillars, all of his obligatory parts, but he's also doing something haram at the same time such as he's eating haram. He's gaining his rizq from haram. He's covered his body in aura with haram. Another example, a person who prays, he's praying five times a day. This is with ikhlas, this is mutaba. But when he is not praying, he goes to a soothsayer or he goes to a magician. Just to find out what he is saying. He doesn't even believe in what he is saying. He just wants to go and find out, and he's curious. What happens? For 40 days, Salah is not accepted. A person, he prays with ikhlas and mutaba, and he's working hard. He's praying Fajr, he's praying Lord, but he's got a bad habit of some kind of intoxicant, whether it's alcohol or drugs or something like that. What happens to him? The Salah is accepted because he's got the ikhlas and the mutaba. But what is now feared for him is a nullification of the reward. So now this is an important principle we have to understand here, is that when we're talking about nullifiers of good deeds, it could be a nullifier of the deed itself, or the deed is preserved, but the reward is nullified. Right. Going back to what we were saying earlier about the Messenger of Allah, so Solomon, the example that we gave of Shib, this is taken from... Uh, a book which is written by Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, and these ten are known as Nawaqid al Iman. It's a book that he's written. I believe it's translated into English. We've given uh, an explanation of this many years ago at Masjid Taiba. Uh, so a detailed explanation of these ten can be found 
uh, on my YouTube channel, and you can just, I mean, there's probably other people that have gone through it as well. And these 10, you know, this is very important. I know the author is controversial, but this is very important. And this has been mentioned with his examples in the explanation that we gave. These 10, every single one of them are an issue of ijma between the scholars. So don't just think he sat there and think, okay, let me think of 10 things which would nullify. No, no, no. There, there is a system and the process in this. He has got these 10 because these 10, there is agreement ijma. Ijma basically means that there is scholarly agreement. Not one scholar from the generations, from Ahl Sunnah who have said, no, we don't agree with this. All of these 10, there is complete agreement from the scholars. Now, if there is complete agreement, then that basically means each one of these has evidences from the Kitab and the Sunnah. Because you can't come to an agreement without the scholars without there being any evidence. Otherwise, what are they agreeing on? These 10 have also been given in a book by Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, rahimahullah, and others from the ulama. And like I said, if you want further clarification and referencing, like I said, if you go to the, 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 the explanation that we gave, inshallah, we give plenty of references and, and, and examples of how this ijma has come about and the evidence is for each one. But I'm just going to go through it very quickly because there isn't much time. Um, and there's a couple of other things I want to discuss as well. So now, these are known as nawaqir and iman. These are known as the things which nullify your iman. After you have attained it for yourself, after you've got the ikhlas and the mutabah. Otherwise, if you don't have the ikhlas and mutabah, you don't have iman in the first place. So this person is working hard, working hard. He's got iman, he's increasing in it. But these 10, if a person does it, even just one, it's ikhlas. All of that hard work is gone. Number one on the list is shit. What is shit? Hey, little one, come here. What? Huh? <laughs> Both of you little ones, come here. Yeah. What is shit? Patel. Come here. Yeah. What is shit? Magic. What is shit? Not sihr. Shit. What is shit? Musa, quickly, what was shirk? When you disbelieve in Allah. What is shirk, Muhammad? When you disbelieve in Allah. No, no, don't copy him. Oh, I want your answer. What is shirk? Shirk is basically... If a person goes to an idol and he works to an idol, like, is that shirk or not shirk? Wow. Is that shirk or not shirk? Shirk. Why is it shirk? He's, no, no, that's different. When he is worshipping other than Allah. Shirk is when you have a Lord. Shirk is when you have a Lord other than Allah. Shirk is when you worship other than Allah. And shirk is when you give names and attributes of Allah to other than Allah. So there's a superhero. He can see through the windows. So not through the windows. Everybody can see through the windows. He can see through the wall. Is that shirk or not shirk? That's shirk. Why is it shirk? That's how the law is that we're seeing. The law is that we're seeing. Thank you very much. 100 points go to you. So now if a person believes that another person is an all-seeing being, is that shirk or not shirk? Shirk. Why? Because? Because he's made it. He's seeing. Thank you. Shirk. And I believe that. You may go away. Him you may be quiet and go away. Thank you. Right. Shirk is when you have a partnership what? granted to the creation of something which belongs only to Allah, whether that's in Rububiyya, Lordship, Uluhiyya, Worship, or Asma'u Sifat, names and attributes. Number one on the list. Number two on the list, even though it's part of it, at tawassul. What's tawassul? Now, tawassul linguistically, we did this before. We've had an Usra session where we did tawassul in detail. So I don't want to repeat too much of that because we've already studied that in detail. But tawassul is to get close linguistically, is to get closer towards something. Linguistically. Obviously, here we're talking about getting closer towards Allah. However, if a person worships other than Allah to get closer towards other than Allah, or a person worships other than Allah, even if he is claiming to get closer to Allah, this would nullify a person's good deed. Now, here's a very good example of how people can confuse the two. A person goes to the grave and worships the person in the grave. Is he doing a good deed? 
In his eyes, yes. In our eyes, based on what we've got here, it's not even our opinion. We're not talking about you know what we think is right. With what we have studied from Orthodox Islam, from the evidences, from the Kitab and the Sunnah, and then the statements from the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, as you have seen from Ibn Kathir Ibn Taymiyyah. They have said this is not a good deed in the first place. The person has gone to the grave and he's asked the person in the grave, there's no ikhlas in this, and there's no mutaba in this. What we're talking about here, tawassul, which is a nullifier, this person goes to the masjid, he prays for the sake of Allah, he does it with conformance to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, by the salah is being finished, he goes to the grave and asks the person in the grave, all of his deeds are gone, may Allah protect. But let's understand the difference between the two that we've just mentioned. Number three on the list, whoever doesn't declare disbelievers as being disbelievers or corrects their beliefs. Now, the wording that is used can seem a little bit um, harsh and intolerant. Okay? But as we talk about you know, as we go through these and we talk about this in the explanation, I would refer, I would like people to refer back to the explanation for clarification further. But here, what this means is if a person thinks that we're all okay, Muslims are okay and non-Muslims are okay. Or you could even say Muslims are correct and they are correct. This is a nullifier of good deeds. You have to call a spade a spade. You have to call goodness goodness and badness badness. And if a person fails to do that, again, like I said, there is more detail, then it could be very dangerous for that person. Number four, whoever says away, now this is similar to number three, just like number two is similar to number one, there is an overlap in each one of these. But number four, whoever says away other than the way of the Messenger of Allah is more complete, or better, then this person has nullified all of his good deeds. So if a person says, yeah, Muhammad وسلم, he came with the truth, but Mirza Ghulam Ahmad also came with the truth, or the Messenger of Allah came with the truth, but Louis Farah Khan has got something better than Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qurashi sallallahu alayhi wa this is example number four. May Allah protect us from that. Number five, to hate something that the Prophet ﷺ came with, even if he acts upon it. This is the very essence of nifa, nullifier of good deeds. Now, I feel like I'm rushing through it, and I do apologize. But like I said, if you go back to the explanation, you'll have further clarification. Hating is different to finding something difficult. Right now, Salat al-Isha, difficult. Salat al-Fajr, difficult. Salat al-Isha and Fajr at the right time in the masjid, difficult. It's hard. You pray Isha so late, 11.30, 12 o'clock even, and then you have to wake up 2.30, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock. It's hard. But finding something difficult is different to a person hating the action. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says in the Quran, kutiba alaykum al-kital wa huwa qurhun is something that you find difficult. So difficult and hating two things. Right, number six, mocking any aspect of the religion. Now, this is really important. What does mocking mean? What does mocking mean? So now, um, this boy over there, he's wearing a thobe, but he's not wearing a hat. And I start laughing at him. Look at him, he's wearing a thobe, he's not even wearing a hat. Is that mocking the religion? Or I'm mocking the boy. What? I'm mocking the boy. So then what does it mean, mocking the religion? Mocking the religion means you're making fun of the religion to insult the religion, to degrade and disrespect the religion. If you are mocking the action of a person or the way a person looks, even though he looks religious, then you are mocking the person. And that is also a major sin. But it is not a nullifier of Iman. Number seven, Sihr. What is Sihr? What is magic? Guys, you should know this. What is magic if you listen to something recent? No, but okay, but why is magic shirk? 
Because how do you not see it? Because you are claiming to know the unseen because only Allah knows the unseen. Okay, that's good because the person is claiming to know the unseen and only Allah knows the unseen. So that's shirk with Allah and names and attributes. And that's shirk. I'm that, oh, good. Okay, so that's shirk in names and attributes and Rububiya because he's claiming that he knows the unseen and he claims that he can change the situation for people. But there's also another reason why magic is shirk. How does a magician become a magician? What does he have to do? Do you remember? Hey, what does he have to do to become a magician? What does he have to do? He has to worship the shayateen. Therefore, sihr in its essence had shirk in rubiya, uluhiya, and asma wa sifat. Number eight, helping the mushrikun against the Muslims. And this is known as tawalli. If a person aids the kuffar, the kuffar against the Muslims to erase the Islamic religion or to fight Muslims for them being Muslims, this person could eradicate his iman. Number nine, to compare that what people have left from the Sharia, just like, okay, so now number nine is very similar to number four, except that number nine, and you will find this amongst some deviant sects, it's permissible for me to leave the Sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm that pious. I don't need to, I don't need to have mutaba anymore. There is no difference of opinion. Like I said, issue of Ijma. Such a person has nullified his iman. Now, number 10 is very, very dangerous. Dangerous. So dangerous that a lot of Muslims are already doing this and they don't even realize. Before we do number 10, there's a question. If a child is born out of wedlock and the father died, can the child be referred to as an orphan? That is a random question. Allah. Is the child an orphan and he's born out of wedlock? Yes, he's an orphan because he has no father and the relationship... This is a fiqhi discussion, even though our lecture here is about aqeedah. The majority of the ulama from the four madhabs have said that the child that is born out of wedlock is attributed to the mother alone. And that father is not mahram, and that father does not inherit, and that father, there's no relationship whatsoever. Only thing is that that father can't marry that girl, if he's got a daughter from, you know, out of wedlock, that's the only thing. Besides that, there is nothing. So if the child's zina father dies, then yeah, uh, even if he doesn't die, he's still considered as not having a father. Number 10, neglecting the religion. This is so dangerous. This is so dangerous. Neglecting the religion. What does that mean, neglecting the religion? Now, where is the ijma in this? Is this something that the sheikh has come out from himself? At the time of Abu Bakr, there are people who prayed. They said, La ilaha illallah. They performed Hajj. They called themselves Muslims. They said, Zakat, we are not giving Zakat anymore. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was alive, we used to give Zakat. Now for Abu Bakr, we're not giving him a penny. To the Messenger of Allah, we'll give him everything. For Abu Bakr, we're not giving him anything. Zero. Abu Bakr said, I'm going to fight these people. Umar bin Khattab, he said, How are you going to fight these people when they say, La ilaha illallah, and they establish the Salah of Abu Bakr? So Abu Bakr said, Lo manauni iqalan, even if they stop me from giving a single rope. Now, rope is not part of zakat. Now, this is to show you the emphasis that Abu Bakr has on this mas'ala. He said, even if there is a rope that they use to tie up the camel, I am going to fight these people. And then Umar, radiallahu anh, says, you know what, Abu Bakr is right. So what is this neglect? Neglect is when a person turns away from one aspect of the religion which is wajib upon him and he doesn't even care about it. This is really important because this is the belief of Ahlul Sunnah. But the Murji'ah and the other deviant sects say, no, no, as long as the person says, La ilaha illallah, even if he prays every now and then, he's a Muslim. We will say, no, there are certain things which are wajib upon you and if you become negligent over those wajibat and you show no concern for them whatsoever, you will then be considered as a person who has neglected his religion. That nullifies Iman and therefore nullifying all of his good deeds.
Right, this now concludes the list that I wanted to cover. There's only a couple of other things that I wanted to talk about before we get to our conclusion. Um, but there are other things which nullify with deeds. So the, the list here consists of shirk and kufr. Basically, these 10 consist of shirk and kufr. But are there other things that could nullify your good deeds? Yes. Number one, major sins. Or should I say number two? Char is number one. Number two, major sins. There are major sins which could nullify your good deeds. And an example of that is this. In Surah Hujarat, ayah number two, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu bil and do not, you know, address him in a manner like you do with one another. If you do so, and all of your good deeds could be nullified and you have no idea. Therefore, is this kufr? No. Is this shirk? No. It's not got anything to do with the rights of Allah, but the person has come with a major sin. There's a narration here that the ulama have said that it is weak, but some of the ulama have seen this as acceptable. Inna Allah la yamhu sayyib is sayyib. And this is going back to what we were saying earlier, as to what is a good deed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not wipe out a bad deed with another bad deed. Rather, walakin yamhu sayyib al hasan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the bad deed with a good one. Or a good deed with a bad one. Like I said, this narration is weak. I've been Pastor Sahih by Darukutni and others from the Ulema. But there are plenty of examples for this. For example, if a person misses his salah, all of his good deeds are wiped out. Innovating into the religion, his good deeds are wiped out. Taking people's rights, as we have seen earlier from the chats. I mean, some of the things that we saw earlier, all of that is correct. But these are things which are now classified as major sins or persisting in minor sins. These could nullify a person's good deed on the condition that the person does not make toba. If the person makes toba, then all of his good deeds are returned back to him. All of his good deeds are preserved for him. And if a person has got bad deeds, whether they are major ones or persistent in minor ones, if he is consistent in making toba and istighfar, if he is consistent in doing good deeds, that's how the person can preserve. His good deeds. I'm not going to read this out because it's a little bit lengthy, but this is just to show you that, like I said before in the very beginning of this lecture, to find a book which has been authored by the Salaf, a standalone book, and talking about the nullifier of good deeds, I have not been able to find one, but I could be corrected in that. But look, for example, Imam Bukhari in Kitab al Iman in his Sahih chapter, Fear of the Believers, inadvertently cancelling out his good deeds, and then he goes on to talking about. You know, the evidence is for that. So it does exist from the time of the Salah, this topic. Imam Muslim in his Sahih. Now, this is not a chapter. It says here, Imam Muslim entitled a chapter. Imam Muslim did not put chapter titles in his uh, in his Sahih, but it was put in afterwards. Some of them said that it was Imam al Nawi that put it in. Others said that it happened before Imam al Nawi. But the chapter exists in there because this is now an interpretation as to what Imam Muslim mm -hmm. wanted. So what did he want? The believer's fear of good deeds being cancelled out. And then he brings hadith after hadith. Therefore, what is a good deed? A good deed is something which is beloved to Allah. What is the what are the conditions? It has to be done with the khas and mutaba. What are the things that can nullify them? Kufr and shirk, major sins, and being persistent on minor sins, on the condition that the person does not make tawbah. And that the person is not being consistent on doing good deeds. So a conclusion from this lecture. We have learned what are good deeds. We have learned what the conditions of having those good deeds are. And this is now a beautiful statement from Sheikh al-Islam al-Thani ibn Muqayyim rahimahullah in Wab al sayyib page number 18. I don't believe it's been translated into English, so I'll put the reference there. He said, the things that cancel out or spoil Remember, we said before, something could be cancelled out altogether or it could be spoiled, meaning the deeds have been accepted, but the reward has not. Are too many to count. 
But we've given the principles here. What are they? Kufr, shirk, being persistent on major sins without making toba, and being persistent in minor sins without making toba and istighfar, and not being consistent in doing good deeds. These five. If you have these five in your life, then you should be fearful that your deeds are being wiped out, or at least the reward of these being of these deeds being wiped out. But if you do slip up, because every single one of us is going to slip up, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go back to Allah with Tawbah and Istighfar and being plentiful in good deeds, being good deeds. If a person does that, look what Ibn Qayyim is saying here, it is not the deeds that count. Anybody can pray Fajr, just one off, or even his whole life. It is not the deed itself. Rather, it's the protection of the good deeds from which may spoil them or cancel them out, which is the most important thing. What is that then? Ikhlas, mutaba'a, istighfar, toba, increase in doing good deeds. You will slip up. You might even fall into an act of uh, minor kufr or minor shirk. It's possible, and he's still Muslim. How does he rectify that so that none of his good deeds are wiped out? Ikhlas, mutaba'a, toba, istighfar, and being consistent in doing good deeds. Those are the five things that every single Muslim needs to have in his life on a consistent basis. What are the things which would nullify your deeds? Kufr, shirk, major sins, and being persistent in minor ones. And this, inshallah, hopefully helps us to understand this very important topic. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to be of the people of ikhlas and that he allows us to be from the people of the sunnah and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts everything that we have put forth and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiplies for us our rewards and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on us and his favor and his grace upon us subhanahu wa ta'ala because none of these things we can establish by ourselves if we are left to ourselves all of our good deeds will be nullified there is no doubt in my mind if we were left to ourselves all of our good deeds will be nullified we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he doesn't leave us, not even for a blinking of an eye, and that he makes us of the people of ikhlas, and that he makes us of the people of purification and so on, and that he makes us of the people who are able to do good deeds in a manner that he is pleased with, and that he makes us of the people who are protected from kufr and shirk, and having any kind of love and connection to anything which is displeasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us firm upon this until we meet him. Jazakumullah khairan Ustaz for that um, long presentation and very beautiful. I know if I gave you more time, you probably would um, continue, inshallah. But yeah, it's a very wide topic. But Ustaz, I've tried as much as possible to summarize them and give us the principle for us to actually judge what could nullify our own goodies as well. So let's take that. I don't think I would um, go through the summary of it again. It's a lot that he has told us, inshallah. Um, so it's time for questions and answers. I know if you have any questions, I know stars have been trying to answer some of the questions as it goes along. But if you have any question you want to ask directly, this is the time to do so. Those on the YouTube, inshallah, if you have any questions, if you type it in the chat area, I will try to pick it up as well. Um, if you prefer to type your questions on Zoom as well, use the chat area and type your questions and I'll try to pick it up. So whilst we are waiting for, okay, I think we've got one here. Um, if someone commits shriek and then did tauba to regain his iman, will he recover the nullified deeds? This the is the issue where the scholars are in total agreement of is that if a person commits kufr or shirk and apostates from Islam, but then makes tauba and istighfar, then all of his good deeds are returned back to him. Look at the favor of Allah. This person has done good deeds. He rejects Allah and he says, forget that I'm going with Iblis instead. And then he comes back to Allah sincerely. Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his mercy. He will say, okay, come back and I'll accept everything that you did in the factory. The issue with this though, the ulama have differed when it comes to hajj. They have said that every single one of us need to have the hajj of Islam. When he apostates from Islam, he has left Islam in effect. So if he did hajj before, when he now makes tawbah and comes back, it was his hajj accepted or not? Some of the ulama have said, no, he needs to do hajj again. Because he needs to die upon having done hajj upon Islam. But the majority have said, 
everything returned back to him. The need for this illa min taba wa amana wa amila amana min saliha, except for those people who make tawbah and they believe and they do good deeds. For these people, you bedded Allah to say, Ati him, Hakanat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace all of those bad things that he did with good ones. And he is so kind. Any questions? Jazakallah khair, Ustad. Do you have any questions? Please do raise your hands or type it in the chat area. Jazakumullah khair, Ustad. Um, I think that was um, well um, delivered. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from nullifying our own good deeds um, and then make us see all our good deeds in, in our scale on the day of judgment. And okay. that would lead us to the mercy of Allah and then to Jannah to fill Can I just say one last thing? Go ahead, Ustaz. If I can give you just 30 seconds. Let's go on. Go ahead, please. Musa alayhi salam, you will find this in Kitab al-Tawheed. Musa alayhi salam, he says, Oh Allah, teach me of something that I can remember you by and supplicate to you with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh Musa, say la ilaha illallah. So Musa alayhi salam, he says, All of your servants say la ilaha illallah. Tell me something which is specific to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says to Musa alayhi salam, had you had all of the heavens and all of the earth filled up with sins on one side, fi kiffa, on one side of the pan, and la ilaha illallah on the other side of the pan, la ilaha illallah would outweigh what was on the other side. Now, the point that I want to allude to here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that there are deeds that could fill up the universe, the universe, the skies above us, and the seven earths below us. Your deeds, your evil deeds could fill all this up. So how big are the scales? Sure. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you can come your qiyamah and your deeds could fill up the universe, your bad deeds in this hadith. But on the other side, la ilaha illallah, would outweigh, so how big are the scales? The scales would fill the universe. Well, if a person comes with la ilaha illallah and the conditions we have seen from la ilaha illallah, those people who have made their scales heavy, how have they made it heavy? They made it heavy with ikhlas and mutabah. These deeds are multiplying so much with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would fill up the universe of examples of good deeds and statements and actions, those which are apparent and those which are hidden. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shalwa la ilaha 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 Wow. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La takul law, do not say if. Because the word if, questioning the qadr of Allah, if opens up for the handiworks of shaitan. So my question to you, sister, what is the benefit of the answer of this question? Or has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that Adam was going to eat from the tree? So what you're asking here really has of no benefit. And for you, if there is no benefit, then there is no answer. If there is no answer, then there's no way of you knowing. So then asking the question, as the Messenger of Allah was on the bed, shaitan opens up for the handiworks of shaitan to play with you. That's the first thing. Second thing, if Adam did not eat from the tree, will humans be on earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed what is going to happen. So this question is asking a question about something which has not been decreed. What has not been decreed is not possible. It's not a thing. It's just hypothetical. Hence the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, do not even go into it because it will affect your submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Barakallah feekum, inshallah, we'll see you again sometime soon, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us life and iman. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, 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 alh